So, thank you. I'm Ryan McDonald. It's great to be here. I'm a nephrologist in the area, and we are talking about one of the hottest topics you could possibly imagine, of course, which is talking about the beans and talking about the drugs with the beans, and we are not going to put anybody to sleep. That is the goal, so I'm watching, watching very carefully. So this is kind of our plan today. We're just going to be talking about interstitial nephritis, antibiotics that can cause interstitial nephritis, and antibiotics that can also just hurt the kidneys in general. So that's kind of our plan. And this guy right here, this is back in 1860, Mr. Biermer, I guess how you pronounce that. So he was the first one that saw interstitial nephritis, didn't really write too much about it, but until this gentleman came along about 29 years later, and William, Count, uh, William Thomas Councilman, he's the first person actually described it, and he called it acute renal dropsy, which I think is a far better name, and I don't know why it didn't stick. I would like from now on to be calling acute renal failure just a case of the dropsy, because it sounds far better, I think, to patients whenever they hear acute renal failure. They panic. They think that the kidneys are burnt and they're done. But if we call them the dropsy, I think that's, that's the way to go. So from now on, you're going to be writing that. I'm going to be writing that in my notes, a case of the dropsy, okay? So here's, here is kind of what we, what we see, the signs and symptoms that we see with, with uh, interstitial nephritis. Of course, all those patients would have uh, acute kidney injury, 100% of those. Uh, but then the other three things that we see, the kind of classic triad, uh, is not always quite there. Uh, fever is about 35%, rash is 22%, and then eosinophilia about 35%. And seeing all three, the classic triad together is even lower. It's probably closer to 10% or less. That's kind of your classic rash, that kind of uh, erythema multiform, uh, that just this blanchy kind of rash that's just usually all over the chest, back, very itchy usually. Um, so we're going to hit some questions. I know maybe, maybe a couple of you out there are going to be responding to these questions. Some of them I potentially made a little trickier, so maybe hold off on answering it until we talk for a minute, but they're, they're not too bad. Um, so here's our first question. What is the number one cause of acute interstitial nephritis? Is it A, infection, uh, B, tubular interstitial nephritis with uveitis? Is it C, medications, D, sarcoidosis? Uh, so, medications is right now our number one cause. That, that's, that's pretty obvious now. Um, what's interesting though is if, so now it's, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll go back to that. But what, here's our next question. So what is the number one medication causing uh, interstitial nephritis? Is it anti-inflammatories, the NSAIDs? Uh, antibiotics? Proton pump inhibitors? Or diuretics? And that is clearly the antibiotics are way ahead of us on that one. So interstitial nephritis definitely has a huge evolution that's gone on. And we're going to look into that real quick. So in the American Journal of Kidney Disease in October 2014, they looked into this real closely. If you look, they, they pulled a bunch of biopsies from 1993 to 2011 to kind of see uh, you know, look at this a little closer. So if you look at Mr. Dropsy here, our, our friend, Mr. Councilman, that found this, the interstitial nephritis in his day versus what we see in our day is, is far different. And so we're going to dive into that. So they found, they, of all the, all the biopsies during this time frame, they grabbed 133 of those. It was only an, done in one center, unfortunately, or it could have been a lot better of a study. But now going back in time a little bit, here we are in 1860 to 1940. What was the most common cause of the dropsy back then, the interstitial nephritis? It was clearly infection, scarlet fever, diphtheria. But really, what was going on until we hit 1940 was we invented antibiotics and then medication started really coming into to pra the practice of medicine. And so that's when everything really changed. And so in going back to our study, it's not a surprise that uh, during that time frame, 70% of those biopsies that caused interstitial nephritis were clearly antibiotics. And these were the other, I'm sorry, were clearly drugs, and then antibiotics being 50% of those. So clearly, if it wasn't for the medications that we have made, we would be really seeing very little. Uh, to no interstitial nephritis. So there's clearly going to be a lot of change in the future of what's causing our interstitial nephritis. Right now, antibiotics are in the lead. 
Uh, we've got PPIs and we've got anti-inflammatories that really depending, depending on the study, which of those has taken the lead as far as the second leading cause. I think it probably is still anti-inflammatories. But then you got that outside lane there and where are those guys coming with this? Who is gonna be the next player that's gonna surpass something else? And it's, it's hard to know, we don't know, you know, a lot of times these medications come out and you don't really start picking up on interstitial nephritis until the medication's been out for a while. So let's hit another question, these are exciting. Which of the following is the best clinical tool for diagnosing acute interstitial nephritis? Is it the urine eosinophils? Is it B, serum eosinophilia? C, the kidney biopsy? D, a gallium scan? And so still, I mean, it seems like it's pretty old school, but yes, kidney biopsy is still the way to make that diagnosis. Now, a lot of the hallways, you may be hearing a lot of the physicians fighting and a lot of arguing going on, and yes, it is because of the urine eosinophil. It's always on everyone's mind. What's the deal with these urine eosinophils? Why are we ordering it? So I'm diving into this. There's a nice picture of your eosinophil if you want to see one. Um, so in this year, in 2013, this group did a really good job of helping us out should we be ordering urine eosinophils or not. And so this is what they did. They grabbed 156 patients that had had urine eosinophils done, and they had also had a kidney biopsy. So here's what they found. So they found that, yes, if you look at a lot, there's quite a few patients that have interstitial nephritis, and there are quite a few patients that do have urine eosinophils. Unfortunately, though, if you look at a lot of the other biopsies that they had, there's also a lot of other, other diagnoses that have urine eosinophils, including acute tubular necrosis, including cast nephropathy, crescenteric GNs, a lot of the other GNs, all of them were having a lot of urine eosinophils present. So what happened at the end of the day, unfortunately, was that the urine eosinophil cannot distinguish between AIN, ATN, or other glomerular diseases, and is probably just a study that doesn't really have much use anymore, unfortunately. There may be more fighting in the hallways after I give this presentation. I don't know, but anyway, so the treatment, uh, cre treatment for acute interstitial nephritis, let's have a quick question. So you're treating a patient with a new acute kidney injury who has been on antibiotics. The biopsy returned and showed severe interstitial nephritis. Typical of your nephrologist, they left town without reviewing with you the biopsy and deciding on a treatment. So you decide on your own, well, I'm gonna go ahead and give this patient steroids. So the question is, what is the best indicator that the renal function will improve? Is it A, the, the current creatinine is less than four? Is it B, starting within one week of diagnosis? Is it C, biopsy only showing moderate acute interstitial nephritis? D, there is negative urine protein? or E, the baseline creatinine is less than one, and I snuck a last one in here just to be more confusing, F, stop the offending drug. So if we look at the answer here, we're gonna kinda go through it. So stop the offending drug is always the answer. Um, it kinda just makes sense. No one's gonna argue about stopping an offending drug, of course, unless there is some type of reason that the patient absolutely needs to be on it, which is quite rare. Um, Supportive care, I, I love in guidelines where you have supportive care in there because every physician needs to be told that they should support the patient. It's always just a strange thing to have, find to have in guidelines. I think otherwise we'd just leave the patient alone. But, oh, gotta support them. So I love, that's my, one of my favorite uh, recommendations always. And then of course, dialysis until recovery. So sometimes these patients have such a severe kidney injury that they have hyperkalemia, they have fluid overload. Uh, uremia or another acidosis problem. So something that needs to support the patient until they're able to recover, make their own urine, be able to and clear out electrolytes, those kind of things. And then of course steroids. Steroids is another one of these uh, hard topics. So we're gonna go with a nice little retro study to help us figure out what to do here. So one, so one study, this is a, a, a pretty good study. It's from the NDT and it looked at acute interstitial nephritis and with giving response to steroids. So they rounded up 60 cases of people that had biopsies with interstitial nephritis. 
And with those, they had 42 of them available as far out as about 12 months, which was actually a hard thing to do. And about 60% of those patients had received steroids. So if you look at some of the data here, uh, I don't really even need to tell you which, uh, which line is steroid and which is conservative therapy because they are all right in line with each other. And if you see at the start where those two arrows are, uh, that's where the kidney injury was. And then after one month, six months, and 12 months, you see that both of those groups are very close and both of them are really identical. And at that end of that study, there was really no significant change between somebody receiving steroids and somebody not receiving steroids. So that's it. No steroids, right? Well, then the Kidney International came along and they decided to make things more confusing for us. And so what this group looked at is they did early steroid treatment claiming that it will improve renal function. So here's what happened with this study. So similar amount of patients, they grabbed 61 drug-induced interstitial nephritis patients. Uh, they treated them early with steroids, so within at least seven days was the target. And so here's what we had. We had about 52 patients in the treatment group. They got steroids, and then our other group was only nine patients. So not a, not a knockout, you know, 10,000 patient study, but the best we kind of get in nephrology. But so here you can see there's definitely a correlation between the delay of steroid treatment and your final serum creatinine. So that line represents as you start getting higher, that's a worsening kidney function as the, as the delay in days weighs on. And this again also, same kind of thing is you have this rapid rise. These are the treatment group up there in blue that when they received steroids, their creatinine was improving far quicker than the, the control group on the bottom there. And so, of, as you can see there, a faster rate of renal recovery was occurring. So, that's a, so th and that kind of makes sense in, in my mind. So if you look at this slide, this is a, a kidney biopsy. You can't see really where is any kidney tissue there because it is socked full of so many lymphocytes, eosinophils, and neutrophils. You can't even see where the tissue is. And so the concerning thing to me when you have something like that going on is when you have inflammation like that, it leads to fibrosis, it leads to scarring. And so the faster you can get rid of that, hopefully can translate into healthier kidney tissue at the end. And that's exactly what these, you know, these, these authors are thinking. And so after, if you look at the treatment here, the patients have less chronic dialysis when they were treated earlier, and their final, their final serum creatinine and less chronic kidney disease uh, both occurred when they were treated early. <clears throat> so the take-home points on interstitial nephritis treatment, stop the drug if you can. It's obviously the first, the first most important thing to do, stop the offending agent. Steroids at less than seven days, it's definitely a conversation to have. Can I tell you it's absolutely the thing to do? No, uh, you want to pick your patients and, and make sure it looks like the, uh, somebody that could definitely benefit from it. So this is what I grew up with, is you stay away from drugs, this is your brain on drugs, but I found one with actually two, so that must have been, they must have been talking about keeping your kidneys off of drugs. And so we're gonna go a little bit away from AIM, but still talk about drugs, some of the more popular drugs that you'll see in your practice that I think are important ones to look at. So this is me in 1982, uh, and of course what I was doing in 1982 was reading this journal article right here, which is, what, when we spotted, what first spotted acute, uh, acute interstitial nephritis uh, due to methicillin. And so methicillin, they, they found this just by looking at uh, 14 patients is when it was first really, you know, first got the spotlight placed on it. And those patients had a pretty severe acute kidney injury. Creatinines were going up to an average of eight. They had serum eosinophilia. They had sterile pyrrhea, meaning they just had a lot of white blood cells in the urine without infection. And of course, nine of them had urine eosinophils, which we won't bring that up. So, and what that found out later on was that methicillin was, was very high risk of leading to interstitial nephritis. About 17% of those uh, getting methicillin would develop interstitial nephritis. So consequently, methicillin went away and it has since been replaced with, with these ones here. Nafcillin, oxillin, cloxacillin, dicloxacillin. So definitely far less interstitial nephritis. There's definitely reports of it in the literature. Um, but are you getting that 17%, which is very high? 
No, I mean, the only one that I actually saw um, a, a, uh, any type of uh, incidence rate was actually with dicloxacillin, which said less than 1%. Um, I feel like I get called all the time anytime someone goes on nafcillin, it feels like it always happens, but, but they say that it's, it's uh, far less than 17%, maybe. So 1990s were excellent for sitcoms, um, and they're also really good for ciprofloxacin. I think in the 90s, everybody got cipro. You came in with knee pain, headache, you got some cipro. And that was when we started suddenly seeing people come in with a rash, people coming in with, you know, AKI. And so, yes, ciprofloxacin is another one that can cause interstitial nephritis. It's, it's pretty low, I think, far less than nafcillin. Um, I, I rarely see it in my practice these days, but it's certainly out there. Um, so we're going to transition over to some new stuff here. So we're going to start with a question. We have a 75-year-old female with diabetes and stable CHF. She is coming into your clinic today with fatigue and weakness. She is finishing a course of antibiotics for a urinary tract infection. She shows, she, I'm sorry, she follows routinely with her cardiologist. Her blood pressure, volume set up, all have been stable. She's been using lisinopril and spironolactone. Three weeks ago, she saw her orthopedic doctor due to severe arthritis. Uh, she was then started on Celebrex or Celecoxib as needed. These are some of her labs as she came in. Her baseline creatinine was 1.2, now it's up to 2. Her potassium, unfortunately, is now up to 6.5. Her urinalysis, though, was normal. So the question, what is going on with this poor lady? Uh, what antibiotic did the patient receive? Was it A, gentamicin? Was it B, amphotericin? C, nafcillin? D, rifampin plus vancomycin, or finally, E, trimethoprinsulfamethoxazole, the worst named antibiotic ever. E, yes, yes, she got the Bactrim. This is the story of my life. So what are the kidney effects of Bactrim? Bactrim is really cool, though, because it's got so many different things that it does. It's pretty exciting stuff. So it raises the creatinine. We'll get into what it's doing there. Uh, less than GFR, you may want to shy away from it or at least just reduce the dose. When you get below a GFR of 30, that's when you do start getting quite a bit of metabolites that are building up from that medication. You can get interstitial nephritis from this medication as well. You can get urine crystals if you gave somebody a ridiculously huge amount, usually like an overdose to be able to get urine crystals, but it can happen. And then, of course, the hyperkalemia. So... I am sorry to put this up there. I hope no one is having flashbacks from med school. But me personally, I, I don't have a tattoo right now, but I think that would be my tattoo right there. That is, that's good, right? I, I, and it'd be both a teaching point and I think the patients would love it. So anyway, so this is a nephron and uh, this is where Bactrim likes to do its work. So it jumps on the proximal, uh, or, or what it does here at the proximal tubule is it actually blocks your, your secretion of creatinine. And so instead of you just urinating out that creatinine, it'll actually stay in your blood, which is why you will see a rise in that creatinine. Not always does that mean that anything bad is happening. It's just part of the physiology of the drug. So if you have a creatinine of 1.3 and it's now 1.6, that's probably what you would expect. But if you're at 1.3 and it's now 6, that's probably a little more than you'd expect, and you sh we should probably look at this a little closer, right? Um, so the potassium effect actually happens a little bit further down the line over at the collecting duct. Uh, over there you have some uh, aldosterone-mediated uh, ENAC channels that is actually where that takes place. And you have and, and some other or some other excuse me some other uh, diuretics that do the, sort of the same thing in that area, amylaride and triamterene. So triamterene is not only sounds a lot like trimethoprim and looks like it, but it also is wired a, a lot like it as well, which is which is very interesting. And then you also have some other ACE inhibitors, ARBs, spironolactone, aplerinone, and NSAIDs that also will reduce your aldosterone levels, and that will cause a you know, a potential dangerous effect when you're using those with Bactrim, so you want to watch that very closely. And also keep in mind diabetes, when someone is a vintage dial, uh, diabetic patient, 
that those people all, also tend to have a lower aldosterone and can respond unfavorably to Bactrim. And that's the old sine wave that you don't want to see your patient have. That typically means they are not going to be your patient for much longer if you don't do something. So um, just going through some other, um, other antibiotics that aren't as interesting that we'll kind of do a little more review on some of these. So the beta-lactams, basically the penicillins, if you take PIPTAs and you add some vancomycin, you're going to really have a much higher risk, uh, an incidence of acute kidney injury when that happens. Um, cephalosporins, when you add an aminoglycoside to those, which we'll get into a little more, that the cephalosporin will potentiate the effect on the kidney of the aminoglycoside, which we'll, we'll explore a little more. And then you have the cephamycins, not much excitement there. Carbapenems, we use the carbapenems a lot when we are having interstitial nephritis, but keep in mind it's still, it still is there as a potential cause. Motobactems, and then finally, of course, the beta-lactamase inhibitors, which is like nafcillin that we've already talked about. So vancomycin also likes to work around the proximal tubule. It affects right here, and what's interesting about vancomycin is it quickly absorbs into that proximal tubule there, and then just programs the proximal tubule to die. So, so I don't think we're getting interstitial nephritis as much there, but it, it likes to jump right into, this is the proximal tubule right here. It likes to get right into there and just program it to die, which is just so sad, right? And so this was, the, by the way, the, the cutest kidney I could find is, we sometimes have like, like kidney fairs, and you have somebody dressed up in a kidney, it looks atrocious. It just looks terrible. And I found Hello Kidney wasn't too bad. But anyway, so is AIN happening with vancomycin? Probably not. It's more likely to be cell death. And the risk factors that are happening with vancomycin being present, of course, is dose. If, if, if it's the take up into those proximal tubules, that's the problem. If you have a dose that's going too high, you're just going to be absorbing more and more of it. Having somebody that already has CKD or acute kidney injury already, it just also makes sense. You have less of those proximal tubules. Or if we're having an acute kidney injury, to me, it probably means that our vancomycin dose is probably starting to get higher than we anticipated it going. And, of course, if you're adding, that just also makes sense. If you're already on another toxic, or, excuse me, toxic medication, then uh, you're, you're going to obviously have more kidney damage. So the risk of vancomycin, uh, obviously the length of time is also a big part of it if they're being on it for a long time. To me, it probably means that you're absorbing more of it over time, but also could mean that you just have a longer time frame to fail at keeping that, that good trough where it should be, right? Uh, the other concern, of course, is that the risk is having a trough greater than 10 to 15. Our guidelines now say the trough needs to be 15 to 20, so just by getting to goal, you're already going to have risk of, of, of acute kidney injury. That's a tough one. And then vancomycin plus additional medications, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Uh, anytime we're dosing higher than four grams a day is, is risky. Um, so here's another question. So we have a 64-year-old male with no diabetes arriving in clinic with abnormal labs. He recently had a gram-negative infection and started on an antibiotic in the hospital and was told to follow up with ID. He received a BID antibiotic in the house, and we're not sure what it is. So suddenly they have a creatinine of 3.5, where previously it was doing just fine. Potassium this time is low. Magnesium, somebody grabbed one of those, it is also low. And now we have a urine that is positive for protein and positive for glucose where the patient has no previous history of diabetes. So we have some concerns there. So what medication is this thing? Is it A, gentamicin, B, vancomycin? Probably not, since we just talked about it. Is it zosin, piperacillin, tazobactam, or is it amikacin? Any takers for that one? Uh, yeah, so 1984, known for its hot cars and Mary Lou Retton. That's all I remember it for. But also this article. <laughs> so the risk factors for nephrotoxicity related to aminoglycosis. So yes, it was gentamicin, and we're going to go into why 
that urine, glucose, and protein were so important. So let's look at what these guys were telling us here. So they, the, the, uh, the authors here found 214 patients in two different, tri in two different, in, um, I'm sorry, two different groups, two different hospitals, with, uh, where they were given either gentamicin or torbromycin. And 14% of those had acute kidney injury, so they're able to look at what the risks were. So a higher creatinine to start. Uh, they were females for some reason, and anyone with liver disease was also more susceptible to acute kidney injury. Uh, looking through some other articles, though, as well, um, there's some other risk factors as well that I pulled out, and that was the dose and duration, which isn't surprising. If they'd previously already been on therapy, low blood pressure, which makes sense that if they're ongoing sepsis, then it's going to be a tough road no matter what. And then the electrolytes, which we'll, we'll go into as well. So this is kind of what happens with aminoglycoside. Same kind of thing. They, every, everybody loves that proximal tubule. And so the aminoglycoside also goes into there. It gets readily soaked up. And it doesn't program cell death like our vancomycin, but it goes in there. It makes the mitochondria and the cell swell which then actually causes you to lose your brush border inside there. And eventually it can even lead to acute tubular necrosis at that same area. And so that's what we're seeing in, in, in when that happens, when you have that proximal transport loss, is that you're starting to just dump the glucose, you're starting to dump potassium, you're starting to dump magnesium as well, which is what you'd see in the labs there. Whoops, we weren't ready to leave yet. Um, and of course, you're losing some protein as well in there. And this is who we can think. That's basically a Fanconi syndrome when, you're, when you have those losses. And you, we can thank Guido for, uh, for helping us out with that. Um, so preventing that, obviously using a less toxic agent would always be nice. Uh, neomycin is probably the worst aminoglycoside out there. Uh, your other three, the gentamicin, tobramycin, amikacin, aren't fantastic. Uh, but your, your least toxic one is going to be your streptomycin. Um, so using a different antibiotic or using a less, less uh, toxic agent would be obviously nice. Um, correcting your bananas and your magnesium with some nuts is also going to be helpful. For some reason, if you're starting behind, the, behind, behind already with potassium and magnesium and starting uh, an aminoglycoside on a patient, it just makes things worse. So having that corrected beforehand seems to help. Um, concern for low perfusion. So if you have a patient that already has low blood pressure, starting that medication is dangerous. Obviously, you know, when you're starting it right out of the gate for a severe infection and a patient is clearly septic, you have to weigh your, your benefits with, uh, with, with your risk there. Um, but if, of course, if you, in, a, in the perfect world, having the blood pressure controlled and having the patient resuscitated would be nice. Um, once daily dosing also seems to help with reducing the risk. Um, so, uh, going back to this again, the aminoglycoside, we talked about that damaging the proximal tubule. And then we also talked about vancomycin hitting the same place. And so, we got some smart authors out there. So, they said, hey, uh, if that causes toxicity and the other one causes toxicity, what happens with both of them? It's not rare for us to be on gent and vanc at the same time. So that's what happened in, in this article. They looked at patients on vancomycin, and about 5% of those were having kidney injury. They looked at patients with gentamicin, a little bit higher, about 11% were having acute kidney injury. Putting them both together, though, was quite a bit higher with about 22%. And that makes sense. They're, both those an antibiotics are hitting the places that are very toxic to the kidney. So in summary, where do we go from here? So we talked about the ear eosinophils. Probably a bad idea. If you want to order them, I can't stop you. Biopsy is still the way to go. Stop the medication. And then the question on steroids. Should we be using steroids? Um, you can find an article to tell you whatever you want to do. Um, I feel like getting rid of uh, inflammation and, and fibrosis is, is good. So I typically do start steroids. Um, how long you're going to do that for is also an area of huge debate. Seven days, I've seen people doing it for a couple months. I think seven days is usually a good shot, but, but uh, yeah, that, it's open. Uh, we talked a lot about different antibiotics out there, uh, especially Bactrim and its interactions 
Uh, watching that, especially with your outpatients with amylaride, tramtrine, anti-inflammatories, spironolactamases, ARBs. If your patient's high risk already has chronic kidney disease, you may want to consider either a different antibiotic or giving them a little bit of a holiday off of one of those medications. And, uh, and nothing is, uh, it doesn't hurt to check these patients a lot sooner. If they're going to start back from have them back in a couple days is to check a potassium and make sure they're doing okay. Uh, the beta-lactam combos are always bad. Cipro, we talked about that, and it's just another cause of AIN. Uh, vancomycin in combo, especially with, uh, with, with zosin and aminoglycosides, um, is, is just really, it's hard to get away from that combination at times, and so just watching them very closely, watching the levels is, is, is the way to go. Um, and then, of course, we talked about aminoglycosides, the alternatives in the high risk and the dose adjustments that are always needed there. And that's about it. What, do we have questions from the floor? I've asked way too many questions. Grilling you guys. Yes? What if you can't get a biopsy done quickly? Uh, so, yeah, it, 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 that's a great, great question. So if you can't get a biopsy done quickly, um, You'd still go down that same path of, of, well, number one, how bad is the kidney injury, right? What medication are they on? If they're on a medication that's pretty high risk, and uh, then I would obviously withdraw the medication and try something else. And, but those situations are always so, they're never, they're never black and white, right? Because you'll have, okay, I stopped this medication, or is this acute kidney injury because they came in septic that we're still dealing with? So those are really hard questions. So... I, I try to look at everything. I'll look at the serum eosinophilia, not really the urine eosinophilia because like we said, everything is kind of there. So I would try that and then looking at, well, is this patient, if it is sepsis and we're worried about that, what is our risk of starting steroids? I mean, if someone is still revolving sepsis and not improving, maybe we don't want to start steroids. But if they look like they're, they're out of the window, they've been resuscitated, they're now stable, they have been on an antibiotic that is, has got their, under, their infection under control. At that point, then, I think it is safe to start steroids and to be able to change an antibiotic. But if it's a life or death situation and, you know, we still have so many other factors that could be causing acute kidney injury, then it's probably safer to keep pushing forward with your antibiotic. Because still, your, your ATN is going to be far more common than interstitial nephritis. So does that make sense? Did I make anyone more confused? <laughs> Michael, that's good. You're good. Okay. Yes. How about um, treating the elderly with uh, antibiotics and urinary tract infections? So Oof. generally, it's recommended to not use macrobiotics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, and that's a really good question, and because I always like, well, you should go talk to your primary care doctor about it. That's, that's usually what I like to say. <laughs> and so, but so my favorite thing to do is to, is to have the patient get a urine analysis and get a culture, and that's so much easier for me to say uh, than when you have a patient sitting in front of you that wants to leave with an antibiotic right then. And so um, a lot of times I'll still use a fluoroquinolone, um, you know, Bactrims can still be a, a good option. It's usually just, just such a bigger option that doesn't need to be used. And so that's kind of what I like to do is use an antibiotic that I can give them a couple days and I'll have the culture that we can change to the appropriate antibiotic. Um, and then I'll have the sensitivity and be able to, to direct it uh, specifically at it. Does that make sense? It's kind of a weenie approach, I guess. But yeah, that's typically what I do. Yes. Yeah, I mean, so that, that's kind of, in, in the ICU, that's all we ever used was you got Vank, Cipro, and Zosin every time you hit the door. And so that's still, so, so that's a very good point. And so remember, you're starting that out of a gate, but you're typically not ending with that 
medication combo, right? By the time that patient's usually three days into the hospital stay, you've figured out what is their infection, what are we targeting at. So if they're coming in with, you know, with say community acquired pneumonia, and that's what we've decided on, usually their, their ER diagnosis may have changed. But so you, so you wouldn't be using vancomycin for somebody with acute, community acquired pneumonia, right? Um, if it's hospital-acquired pneumonia, yeah, you might use Vanc for a little bit longer, but the chances of them having MRSA pneumonia or something like that is probably pretty low. So after a couple of days of antibiotics, you should be changing your antibiotics anyway. So does that make sense? So if they were on, you know, 14 days of that, then, yeah, that's when you're going to start seeing kidney damage from an antibiotic. Otherwise, you know, a couple of days is not the, the problem. It's the, it's the duration of therapy and being exposed to the toxin is, is what's causing the damage. Good question. Yeah. What about uh, low dose antibiotics used for extended periods of time? So, like UTI prescription. Oh, yes. Aspirin treatment where you're talking either long term or three months treatment. Yes. Uh, one, one of my favorite things to treat in the clinic is recurrent urinary tract infections. So, yes. Um, so, it. What I typically try to do in that situation is, number one, making sure there's not something structurally wrong that is preventing urine from leaving the body, right? So usually that involves urology's help or a gynecology's help, somebody else to, that does more than I do to, to figure that out. I've never had that come back helpful, but we have to make sure, right? And a lot of times also I try to make sure, is this patient retaining urine is this that's typically the problem with these urinary tract infections that just keep coming back is for some reason or not fully emptying the bladder so trying to work on areas of totally eliminating the bladder and also making sure they're staying well hydrated so so urinary tract infections do not happen nearly as often as somebody who's staying well hydrated right and so making sure their hydration is up and then once you've got to that point if they're having more than say you know four urinary tract infections a year, that's when I start saying, okay, now we can think about what are we going to do about a long-term antibiotic at a low dose. And so, yes, I have done that uh, on several occasions, and I'll use something small, you know, a, a single dose of Bactrim a day or three, even three times a week. Um, and and there's, a, there's, a there's a long list of antibiotics that you could use. You'll, you'll want to look at what this patient has had before um, as far as sensitivities and use a small dose and be able to, to push it out. And sometimes I'll go six months uh, on an antibiotic and then stop and see what happens. And that seems to have, I've had a lot of success with that. Uh, of course, your risk that you want to talk to the patient about is, is well, our risk is that you're going to, we're going to start forming mega bugs because we're prolonging your your uh, antibiotics and, and you're going to have more, more uh, antibiotics that are less and less sensitive. But the same thing's happening when we're treating them month after month with a new antibiotic. So uh, it is a, it's, a, it's a really tough, um, a, a tough thing to treat those urinary tract infections when we can't figure out what's wrong. But that's, that's typically what I'll do. And, and, and uh, of course, making sure that they, making sure that it is an infection that is, that is causing symptoms though too. So a lot of times I'll have patients come in that they are on an antibiotic every couple of weeks because their doctor tells them they have an infection, but they have no symptoms, they have no burning, no fever. And so those patients I will not treat and try and just, you know, they'll, they'll, and they'll tell me, well, my urine stinks. I'm like, oh, I don't care. It, everyone's urine stinks. Don't, don't worry about it. Let's get you through this. And as long as we're not ending up septic in the hospital, we're, we're doing okay. So that's typically my approach. Does that help? Okay, yes? It's on your uh, slides. I thought I saw the PPI the AIN. Did I mention that? I, did I bring that up? <laughs> I did bring that up. Yeah, tell, tell me about that because uh, I give PPI to everybody. <sighs> yeah, so we were putting PPIs in the water for a while. And, uh, <laughs> and so now PPIs have caught up with anti inflammatories, which uh, you know, most nephrologists are kind of against anti inflammatories, wouldn't you say? <laughs> So, so PPIs now are becoming on our target now as well. And so, you know, we used to have our backup plan was, well, I'll take everyone off of PPI and put them on ranitidine. And then they came out and said that ranitidine causes cancer. So that wouldn't help. Um, so, so nowadays, I think the, the, what you want to do is, is I don't want to be taking a bunch of people off PPIs and then they, 
they show up with, you know, with throat cancer in my office a few months later. So I will talk to the patient and first find out why are they on this drug, right? And I, it is extremely rare that I will see a patient that, um, uh, that is on it just for no reason anymore. It used to happen quite often, but nowadays I think we're a lot better at it. That, so if, they're, if, they t if, they, if you're able to, to stop it and, they're, and they have severe reflux, I, I put them on it. I'll try to wean somebody off, especially patients that I don't have an explanation for their, their renal insufficiency. They're really not diabetic. They're not hypertensive. Their only medication is, a, you know, omeprazole or something like that, right? And their creatinine is 1.4. So it's not really, it's not like this patient is about to go on dialysis because of a PPI. So what we'll try to do is, well, let's try and see how bad you need this drug. So I don't want to stop at cold turkey or they will get some reflux. And so I'll try having them say, let's try this every other day and see how you do. And sometimes we have success with that. And that's great if we can have a less toxic medication uh, causing the damage. And we're seeing improvement in the kidney function, then, then that's a good thing. But I, I, I typically, even when I have somebody stop it that doesn't even know why they're on it, their creatinine didn't, usually doesn't get better. Um, so one of, the, one of the trials that I uh, go back to a lot in, in, in this same situation is a lot of those patients, you did see this rise in creatinine until I think it was about six, six months, and then you start seeing the creatinine coming back. No, actually, it was more longer than that. I think it was 720 days was the day that now that suddenly the, the creatinine started to improve. So it, it, it's a hard one um, for, for me as well. I know it's a, a hard one for you as well when, when we have our patients going to see the GI doc and, and everything was going great and then we stopped their medication. So it, it's, it's not always a cut and dry interstitial nephritis with a PPI where they come in and they're like, I took this for a couple weeks and I have, this, I have hives and I have a creatinine of 1.8. That I've never seen that in practice. I've, have you seen that very often? Me neither. So it's usually this smoldering rise in the creatinine, which gets to about 1.6 or so. And then after time, it seems to gradually taper itself down. So if you have a patient that has just a, a severe amount of reflux and, and you know, our GI specialist wants to keep on it, I think you just have to muscle through it and, and watch the kidney function. If you're continuing to have a rise in creatinine, um, uh, after watching it, then you have to uh, consider doing something different, a kidney biopsy to, to prove that it's AIN and kind of go from there. But it's not a, it's a hard thing to treat because it, it's not cut and dry. I don't typically biopsy a patient of a creatinine at 1.4 with no other comorbidities. So I guess at the end of the day, I'm, I'm not as concerned about it most of the time. Is that good with you? I've got one of my colleagues here, so I've got to run it past him. <laughs> and that, that's how I've been treating the patients. And it seems, you know, I've never put a patient on dialysis because they were taking a PPI. That's for sure. More questions? Okay, thank you very much.